Imagine simplifying one of the most popular scales used for soloing, laying it out on the fretboard in a way that's easy to remember, multiplying it so you get even more notes out of the deal, and having a virtual endless amount of musical ideas to draw from in a way that covers a lot of the fretboard. Well, that's what we're gonna cover today, but be sure to stick around till the very end of the lesson because I've got a free gift for you and your guitar that you're both gonna love. Okay, so what is this scale that is arguably the most, if not one of the most popular scales used for soloing? I'm speaking, of course, of the A minor pentatonic scale, but the very stripped down version of the A minor pentatonic scale, because the pentatonic scale in essence is just five notes, penta meaning five. So if we take, for example, in the key of A minor, right, the A minor pentatonic scale, which is almost always and exclusively played in that particular position. We're gonna shake it up a little bit, but we're actually gonna boil it down to its five basic notes. So the five notes in the pentatonic scale are actually, you got your root, your minor third, your fourth, your fifth, and your minor seventh there. So you have five notes, one, two, three, four, five. But what we're gonna do is we wanna lay them out on the fretboard in a way that, like I said, is easy to remember and easy to multiply, right? Because we like to use multiple octaves when we're soloing. We don't wanna just be in one register, right? So let's take a look at this. We're gonna look at this layout of the minor pentatonic scale. It's actually gonna start on the third fret of the low E string, then the root, which is the fifth fret, all right, and then we have third fret, fifth fret on uh, A. And then we have seventh fret on A. So you'll bring your finger, your third finger up to play that seventh fret. And it actually works as a nice sort of way to just slide into that note. Now, you may not think it just at first glance, but these are the same five notes contained within the A minor pentatonic. They're just in a different order, right? So we're not starting with the root anymore. We're actually starting with the minor seven, also known as the flat seven, right, which is G. Same note as this. Just an octave lower here. And then we have our root. Then we have our uh, minor third, right, which is here. So same note, so we have minor seven, root, minor third, fourth, and then fifth. All the necessary components to make up the minor pentatonic scale in A minor, right? But it's, you know, it doesn't sound quite the same as, right? Just the order of the notes gives it a different inherent sound, and that's gonna come in handy when we're using this for soloing. So we effectively have a layout, an extended little layout of the A minor pentatonic scale, right? We're starting on G, then A, then C, D, E. So minor seven, root, minor third, fourth, fifth. If you wanna get technical, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, right? So that's our initial octave. So right there, we already have a little bit of a different movement through the scale, because if we were to just you know, let's say use uh, this particular position for A minor pentatonic, you know. You can get some good sounds out of that, but when it's laid out like this, there's just something, I don't know, smooth about it, right? Could be that slide is what really makes it smooth, right? So we have that to work with. Now, what about multiplying it across two additional octaves to exponentially increase the amount of notes that we get, right? Pretty cool and easy. This is the best part. We're gonna employ what I like to call the three for one octave system, where we take a one finger pattern, a single finger pattern, right? And then we're going to get basically three more finger patterns out of it that are just in different positions on the fretboard and in different octaves. So when we're moving to this now middle octave from the low octave, right, we're actually gonna be playing this. So it's gonna be five, seven, five, seven on the uh, D and G strings and then nine on the G string. So. Do you hear how those are the exact same notes as? Same exact notes, but a little bit of a different timbre because now we're in this middle octave. So we can actually get different sounds out of the same notes effectively, just by virtue of the octave that they're in, right? So we have our second octave, but we got one more octave to explore, okay, an upper octave. So to, in order to find this, we're actually gonna take this finger pattern, we're gonna shift it here, starting on the eighth fret of the B string, then 10th fret, and then eight, 10, 12 on the high E. Thank you. 
You hear how those are the exact same notes, right? Just in different octaves. That's what's so cool about it is that we really just took one little pattern and just did three for one. We got three octaves out of it. And check out, check out how we just went from the third fret to now the 12th fret, you know, being able to cover all that distance using that finger pattern. And what's great about, especially this particular note right here that we slide into is that it's a great little segue into each octave. So we can go like, And you can essentially walk up, just, just in a linear way, walk up from the third fret to the 12th fret just by following through with that pattern. It's pretty remarkable. But of course, just that by itself will only get you so far. You wanna be able to make good use of the notes that you have available to you. Now, what I particularly love about a pattern like this used in the three for one octave system is that it discourages you from noodling more so than if you were to play in a, you know, kind of a more ergonomic linear finger pattern, right? Where it's a lot more tempting to just kind of ascend and descend, which is gonna get boring after a while if that's the only way that you know how to solo. So at least with this, it, like I said, it discourages you from noodling because it's harder to just like go up and down and up and down when you're having to travel across the fretboard to this amount, right? So the, it allows you to really listen to the notes and really milk them for all they're worth, which is what you wanna do if you're trying to solo with the proper intent. You wanna be in control when you're soloing, right? So having a simple framework like this is great because you're thinking a lot less and you're just listening because listening is a huge part in learning how to improvise. You wanna be able to not only listen to yourself, but when you're listening to music, when you're listening to the music that inspires you, right? There's certain things that it does where it just perks your ears up and it just it gives you that, it, you know, that rush of, of dopamine, right? It just like feels great when you hear that particular moment in a song or in a solo, right? But it's all using just notes that we all know and have access to just done in a certain way. So that goes back to that intent I'm talking about. So with a layout like this, we can focus on the intent. And in order to actually inject some intent, it's about just having a little bit of control. So control comes from listening to the notes. <laughs> and just kind of hearing what they do when you just kind of wander through them. And then of course, applying what we like to call guitar linguistics, which are things that will make the guitar sound more vocal and more expressive, like slides, vibrato, bends, all that kind of stuff. It'll make your guitar playing a lot more uh, spicy, a lot more interesting than just robotically, you know. You know, and, and it, it adds that intent that I'm talking about. So it doesn't take much. Just throwing in some slides and bends and vibrato, maybe some trills. You know, if you want to do that, all that kind of stuff is, is totally fair game when you're using a layout like this. Oh, and hey, by the way, if you're getting value out of this lesson, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to our YouTube channel. It really helps us out and it lets us know that you want to see more lessons just like this one. So thanks in advance and let's get back to it. So what I'm gonna do now to demonstrate this, I'm gonna throw on that backing track again that you heard in the beginning of the video. And then I'm just going to kind of wander through the notes a little more casually. I'm not gonna do anything flashy or anything, just to really listen, right? And, and hear what those notes can give me wherever I decide to put them. So now give you a little play-by-play -play of what I was doing. I just was moving through the octaves at first to hear the different sounds I can get using the same notes, just in different registers, right? So I started low and just like, you know, you can kind of get like those kind of mean, really like uh, like blues rocky kind of sounding. With that low register, it's really cool, it's nice. So that kind of has a thing, right? And then as far as the thing in the middle octave, uh, you know, I was focusing on like really like, Kind of like, you know, thematic sort of phrasing and of course very bluesy, but now in a way that's a little bit more audible and it cuts a bit more. Uh, not quite as mean sounding as the lower register, but like I said, it's a little bit, it's a little bit aggressive in that sort of like uh, the fact that it just cuts, right? And then when I move up to the upper octave, it was just making it scream, you know? You know, so you want to think of it almost like what a singer does. You know, if a singer were to really explore their range, 
start slow and low, right? To just kind of like those like earthen kind of tones that, that can be a little bit uh, haunting in a way, right? And then kind of moving it up to that middle register where that's like bringing up some intensity and starting to, to cut a little bit more as I'm saying. And then when it's just going on a full on scream, it's like going to that upper octave. So you kind of have a dynamic range right there that's something that a lot of like really, really talented singers would do. And so you really wanna think of it that way. You don't wanna just focus on, you know, just moving through the octaves and kind of treating them like they're all the same. Because even though the notes are the same, the octaves being different kind of colors the sound in a different way. So I really want you to listen for that so that you can almost assign like a thing to each octave. Like how I said, like the, the thing for the low octave is like that mean sound, middle octave just cuts, and then the high octave just screams. So you can even use that if you want, right? Or you can just kind of come up with your own descriptors that'll help you when you're, when you're improvising so you can think like, okay, I'm in the low register, I'm gonna get a little mean, right? Or I'm in the upper register, I'm gonna make a scream. So it's like mean to scream and everything in between. That was super corny, but I had to do it. So now let's take a look at some guitar linguistics. Now that we've kind of explored the color we can get from these different octaves. Let's think about things like slides, bends, and vibratos, right? Because those are all fair game, as I said. So we can put some more effort into those guitar linguistics to spice things up even further. So for example, like slides, which like I said, is, is such a natural feeling thing to slide from that, like if you're in the low octave, from that fifth fret to that seventh fret, and then of course from that uh, uh, seventh fret to that ninth fret, and then that 10th fret to that 12th fret on the high E string. So that sliding stuff is really nice, but you can do slides, I mean, anywhere. You can go like. You know, exploring slides with each octave, like just start with one little guitar linguistic thing at a time, you know? Yeah, and just stay within the framework of those notes just to keep it simple so you're not having to think as much, right? So you do that and then you're like, okay, let's try some bends, you know? This has a great sound, you know? Then you can start combining them. So there's all kinds of fun liberties you can take with it. Again, not having to deviate from that five note finger pattern that we're just kind of uh, you know perusing the whole fretboard with, but you can spice it up and really like the, the, the possibilities are endless. Like you should never be able to run out of ideas. If you find that you are running out of ideas, the problem is not the scale or the amount of notes you have. The problem is that you're approaching it in a single kind of way. And if you do that single way, you know, over time, it's just gonna get stale and boring. And you're gonna think that you just don't you don't have any more like notes to work with and you gotta learn another scale or something, right? But what you really wanna be able to do, and what I invite you to really practice uh, doing is if you if you run into that little rut, just do things a little bit differently. Just like take what you normally do and like maybe do the opposite. So for example, if let's say the first thing you wanna do when you're playing like the middle octave, right, would be something like this, what I've been doing pretty much this whole time. Let's say that's your first move. You're like, you're ready to solo and that's your first move. And then after a while you're like, man, all my solos are sounding the same. Like it's like no dub because you're just doing that same move. So instead try to do the opposite, just as a starting point. Like let's do that thing pretty much backwards. That has a completely different sound. It's played virtually in the same way, but the order of the notes is different. So instead of, it's like backwards. So if you do that, you're automatically gonna hear yourself play something a little different. And then you can start making slight changes. So instead of like, if you're more of, a, of an ascender, let's say you would do an ascending lick, you now are just focusing on descending licks. And, and just like make yourself do it for like a whole run through a, over a backing track. It's like only focus on just doing the opposite move of what you normally do. So if you're an ascender, become a descender just for that, just to get used to that, right? So. So you're focusing on a descending kind of motion rather than an ascending motion. And over time what that's gonna do is it's just all gonna start cluttering and get compartmentalized in your head so you have all these different ways of approaching the same notes. And when you add on to this over time by making slight changes, not big changes, 
slight little changes, you're, you're gonna be able to approach you know, a solo in a very creative way and you're gonna have really a lot of control because you've heard it so many times and you've heard it in so many different ways that you'll just be able to pick and choose. It'll be like a buffet of like, I wanna do a descending lick now because I've done it so many times and like I know how it sounds or it's like, or I wanna do a really, really bendy kind of lick that goes across all octaves like. And you're just making that whole pentatonic playground a whole lot more interesting. So now you've got yourself a dense pentatonic playground in the key of A minor to practice this three for one octave sort of extended minor pentatonic layout. And you can do it over any backing track in the key of A minor or like a blues and rock, even if it's an A, because you can totally throw in minor pentatonic over a track like that. And it'll just give you a whole lot of you know different uh, um, uh, styles to work with. And in fact, by diversifying the sort of genres that you're playing over, even if it, they're all in the key of A minor, it'll inspire newer and different ideas because you'll start to develop a time feel and just kind of a certain rhythm to the way you do it. So let's say there's like something that's a little bit more like funky, right? You can do stuff like. And you know, you're just kind of approaching it very differently than you would a more straight ahead kind of rock sound. So I invite you to spend your next practice session focusing hugely on what we just covered today and just have fun, experiment, try things out, take risks, right? That's the way you can figure out if something works or it doesn't. And I mean, you can ask around like, does this scale work? Is this right? Am I doing this okay? You know, I, I completely understand uh, the desire to be inquisitive when it comes to that stuff, but this is all creativity based and it's very subjective. So if you really want to know, there is an inner musician inside you that inspired you to pick up playing guitar in the first place, right? You're still in the process of getting to know it, but you'll really get to learn more about it if you try things out on your own in a you know, safe environment where it's just you playing to a backing track and just, you know, like I said, taking risks and experimenting. That inner musician, right, your own ear, is gonna tell you whether you like something or not. And if, let's say, you like something that was technically like broken or, or bending a rule as far as music theory is concerned, that doesn't matter. Because if you like it, if you like how it sounded, it sounded good to you, it inspired you, that's, that's all that it's about right there. When it comes to the, the creative process in music is you wanna continuously find inspiration. You're more likely to find inspiration when you're doing that than if you're reading about music theory in a book or something. And today we covered the key of A minor, but imagine being able to take what we learned today and expand it across any musical key in any position on your fretboard. Well, that happens to be very relevant to that free gift I was telling you about. And now that you made it to the end of the lesson, I gotta make good on my promise. So, here it is. This is a comprehensive lesson on how to instantly solo in any key. It's gonna show you how to take what you learned today and expand it across all musical keys all over your fretboard, and it's yours free today. Be sure to click here to claim your copy or check that link in the description box. I don't think anyone should ever be afraid of keeping it simple when it comes to music, much less guitar. There's a lot of beauty and simplicity and a whole lot of fun to be had. Case in point, what we just learned today. 